Hello, Dr. Deo Hatfield. It is great to, uh, to be together again as a family as we are journeying just one step further in our series, Those Jesus People. Now, in this series, as we know, we, we're reading and learning through the book of Acts, where we are trying to see how the early church, the first church, managed to follow after Christ wholeheartedly and devotedly, so much so that in Acts it's the first time that people that follow Jesus are called Christians, sold out to Christ. Now as we take this, uh, this next step, I want to share with you a story of the day that I met John Legend on the Gau train. It's a relevant story to the sermon, so don't please switch off. It's a story that talks about relationships. So I was in Santon late at night on my way home when I was still traveling with a Gau train outside of lockdown. I was standing on the, on the platform and something in the corner of my eye just uh, alerted me to attention being brought back to where I was standing. So I didn't know what it was and I, I sort of just cast my eye to the left and I realized that there was a guy standing to the left of me and he was looking at the girl that was standing in front of me. Now, he couldn't keep his eyes off her. He was like peeking the whole time and then realizing that he may maybe she's going to see him. So. He was trying to be as innocuous as possible. But at some point, I realized that this guy, now, even though it was like 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock at night, he was going to go into action. How did I know? Well, at some point, we were standing to the right. He's standing to the left. He lifted his elbow ever so slightly and just sniffed for a moment just to see whether it was still appropriate this late at night to approach a lady. As he did that, I knew that this guy had a plan. I knew that he had a purpose. As he put his earphones into his ear, switched on a song of music on his phone, and then proceeded to come and stand exactly in front of me, between me and the lady that he was hoping to now meet. But this guy was brilliant. He was just so creative because how do you now approach a lady in this type of circumstance? So as the train approached, he started humming the song that he heard through his earphones. And immediately as he started humming, I knew the song and I thought, ah, oh, okay, so I know the song. And then I realized where the lyrics were going to go and realized why he chose the specific song. He was humming the song and you could see that the, the girl in front of him just turned her head ever so slightly. And then as the train came into the station, obviously the, there was noise and he then absentmindedly started singing the song. So as the doors opened, he belted out, Cause all of me loves all of you. And by this time, this girl was just, she was flabbergasted. She didn't know what was going on and she knew that she liked the song. And uh, as they walked into the train, she turned to the left and he continued after her singing, Love your curves and all your edges. And by this time, her knees were like wonking. All your perfect imperfections. She walked into the train. She collapsed into a chair. He moseyed right next to her, sat down next to her and said very, very cool and calm. Hi, I'm Stephen. So they started chatting. And the first thing that he asked was, so where do you get off? on the train because it is Santon Station, then Marlborough, then Midrand, Centurion, and Hatfield and so on. And she said, no, she's getting off at Hatfield. Where are you getting off? No, he said, at Centurion. Now, by this time, everybody in this car was brought into this situation because the question that we were asking was, is he going to get her name? Is he going to get her number? Because it's like 22 minutes to get to Centurion Station. And this little guy just tried his utmost. He was charming and he was telling stories and he was making jokes. But the girl, to her absolute credit, was so collected. 
she did not offer him one iota of detail. Not a name, not a number, not where she's from, not where she's working. He had to work for it. By the time that we got to Midrand Station, you know, everybody was thinking, oh my goodness, it's just only a few minutes until we get to, get to Centurion. And, and we were trying to coax him. At some point in time, I felt like maybe I should intervene here and just introduce them to each other and give a name or a number or something. And I realized that that would be so rude and so offensive. So I didn't. As the train slowed getting into Centurion Station, everybody was exasperated. We just said, okay, so please just somebody do something. And this poor guy got up and he started to leave the train. She shouted after him. Oh, by the way, if you want to contact me, my name is so-and-so, so you can get me on Instagram. I also get off at Hatfield Station, and as I got off, I could hear this guy shouting and screaming right the way into the car park. So why the story? Why the story of John Legend on the Gau train? Well, the thing is that it is amazing how we would chase after certain relationships that we don't actually know whether anything would come of it. We would put passion and energy and creativity and song and testosterone. We would like put everything into certain relationships, chasing after them, even though we don't know whether there would be anything that comes from it. But then there are other relationships where we struggle so desperately to take even one step closer to a person or a community where we know that if we do so, the atmosphere of our lives, the atmosphere of our homes, of our cities, of our workplaces, of our communes, of our student spaces would change. But we struggle. So today, the sermon is entitled, Those Jesus People, A People of Reconciliation. Reconciliation in its just most simplest form means then a people that are called to restore relationships. And in talking about a people of reconciliation, we are going to ask three questions. The first of which is, are we called as Jesus people towards reconciliation? Are we called to restore relationships? And then if so, why do we struggle so desperately to step into that role? And then lastly, if we are able to understand the answers maybe scripturally to those two questions, we then go very practically into, okay, so how do I do it then? Let us delve into the first question. Are we called to restore relationships in the first place? Now, I don't suggest that we go and ask the question now from a moral perspective. So, do we have a moral obligation to restore relationships and to engender reconciliation? So, I don't want to go there. I would much rather us today, as a church family, think about this question in the context of, do we as Jesus people, as Jesus followers, do we have a responsibility to restore relationships? And the reason why I personally would much rather look at it from that perspective is that we all know that the world that we live in, not only South Africa, but such a large part of this world, not only the continent, but the globe, live in such a divided and divisive world. And not even the best moral will in the world has been able to bring us together. And hence my question from a scriptural perspective. Let's read from Colossians 1 verse 19 in trying to get a scriptural reference to this question. Are we called to restore relationships? For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Who is him? Him is Jesus. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus. Why? 
through Him, through Jesus, to reconcile everyone to Himself. You see, it was the purpose of Christ. It was the reason why Jesus came to earth to reconcile us to His Father. A purpose that would take His life. A purpose that needed fully man, fully God, indwelled with the characteristics and the power and the influence of God to be able to get right. And when this word reconciliation is used here in Colossians 1.19, it means to change completely. So the purpose of Christ was to come to earth through His death and resurrection, saving us from our sins changing our past, our present, and our future forever completely. That's what happens when you invite Christ into your life, when you say, I appropriate, I take what you have done for me for my whole life, for my home being. Everything changes completely at that point in time. And then we start journeying with the Holy Spirit in aligning our lives more and more towards Jesus, His example and His purpose for our lives. Jesus' purpose was reconciliation. Reconciliation being defined and translated as changing completely. If we then take a step further into 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 19, this reads as follows. Everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ. And here's an and. And has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespass against them. And here's the punchline. And he has committed this message of reconciliation to us. And here the word reconciliation means restoration to divine favor. What Jesus did was come and change our lives, our past, present, future completely. And then we are called to be ministers of that reconciliation into this world as we walk into our spaces of work and play and love and we work with people restoring them to divine favor. If we take these two scriptures together, Colossians 1.19, 2 Corinthians 5.18-19, the answer to our question, are we called to reconciliation, can be summarized as follows. God filled Jesus with his whole being to fulfill the purpose of reconciliation with godly power. That changed everything completely and forever. And for that reason, we have been called with the power of the Holy Spirit that live in us and indwell us to go out and restore people's lives to the divine favor that they have in God. Short answer to the question, are we called to reconciliation? Is yes. Are we empowered towards reconciliation? Yes. Do we have an example of how it's done? Absolutely. Now we are going to go into the two further questions. The first, why do we struggle so to step into a reconciliatory role? And then, how do we do it? And for that, we are going to go into Acts. We are going to take a step further into the storyline that we have been studying for the past few weeks into Acts 10. We're going to read from 1 to 33. There was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. He was a devout man and feared God along with his whole household. He did many charitable deeds for the Jewish people and always prayed to God. At about three in the afternoon, he distinctly saw in a vision an angel of God who came in and said to him, Cornelius. Staring at him in awe, he said, What is it, Lord, recognizing God who was speaking to him? 
The angel told him, your prayers and your acts of charity have ascended as a memorial offering before God. Now send to Joppa and call for Simon, who is also known Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. And when the angel that spoke to him had gone, he called these people together. He explained to them what was happening and he sent them off to Joppa. In verse 9 we read, The next day, as they were traveling and nearing the city, Peter went up to pray on the roof about noon. He became hungry and wanted to eat, but while they were preparing something for him to eat, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open up and an object that resembled a large sheet coming down, being lowered by its four corners to the earth. In it were all the four-footed animals and reptiles of the earth and the birds of the sky. And a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. In verse 14, we read, no, Lord, Peter said, for I have never eaten anything unpure and ritually unclean. And again, a second time, the voice said, what God has made clean, do not call impure. This happened three times and suddenly the object was taken up into heaven. And while Peter was still deeply perplexed about the vision that he had seen and what it might mean, the people from, jo from uh, Cornelius' house happened into his space. They called him and said, Simon, are you the Simon Peter? And in verse 19 we read, And while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit told him, Three men are here looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them with no doubt at all because I have sent them. And Peter went down and he met the men and he said to them, here I am, the one you are looking for. What is the reason you are here? And then in verse 22, they proceed to tell him that who Cornelius is and why he sent them. And in verse 23, we read that the next day, Peter got up and he set out with them and some of his brothers from Joppa went with him. The following day, he entered Caesarea. Now, let's just pause here for a moment. Caesarea in that day was like a, a very famous region and city in the Roman Empire. The issue in Caesarea at that point in time was it was a divided society, harshly divided between the Romans and the Jewish people. The historians write that in 66 AD, after a revolt from the Jewish population, each and every one in that city that was Jewish were killed. So from a safe haven in Joppa, Peter and some of his friends happened into Caesarea, into a space that would a few years later just blow up as a result of the divided nature of that society. This is where God calls Peter into. Now Cornelius in verse 24 expected him and he had a whole house full of people there. And when Peter entered verse 25, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet and worshipped him. In 26, Peter said, no, no, get up. I'm a man myself. 27, while taking him, he went and found the large gathering of people. And here Peter said to them, you know it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner. But God, but God has shown me that I must not call any person impure or unclean. And in verse 29, that's where Peter says, that's why I came without any objection when I was sent for. So may I ask, why did you send for me? And then Cornelius tells him about his vision. And at the end of verse 33, and this is where we stop our reading of Scripture, Cornelius says the following, So now we are all in the presence of God to hear everything you have been commanded by the Lord. So why do we struggle to restore relationships. If we look at, at Peter's life, if we look at what happened here in, uh, in Acts 10, Peter struggled. I mean, God calls after him three times. He even back chats God. 
Now, if you look at the, at the commentators, why, why did Peter not just concede and say, yes, Lord, here I go from the get-go? Why did God have to bring down a vision three times? Why did God have to convince him? Why did Peter struggle so? So some of the commentators say maybe, you know, he was hungry and maybe he felt that God was testing him. Maybe he felt like Jesus went led by the Spirit into the wilderness and didn't eat for 40 days and then was tempted. But then the commentators say probably not because he realized that God was speaking to him and that he wasn't being tested or tempted. Other commentators say, well, okay, guys, this is Peter. You know, he takes people's ears off and he say, no, God, you won't die. You know, and I'll be there. So maybe he was just being Peter. And then some of the other commentators say, no, at this point in his life, I mean, this is after, after his whole life changed and he was called to, to be his faith in Jesus, to be the rock on which the church would be built. This is after the sermon that he gives at Pentecost and so many people being drawn into those Jesus people fraternity. Some of the commentators, and I agree with them, they say, well, maybe people, Peter struggled because God was speaking to him about something that was under the surface of his consciousness. Maybe God was speaking to him about something that was hidden below his religion and below his tradition. Something was formed in him in his tradition and in his religion. And God wanted to speak to him below that surface. We read in Acts 10, 17, that he tried to figure it out with his cognitive mind, right? So he said, while Peter was deeply perplexed about what he had seen and what it might mean, Peter was thinking about this. He was trying to figure it out. In Acts 10, verse 19, is also made clear. It says, while Peter was thinking about the vision, the Spirit told him, three men are looking for you. So he was trying to figure out it with his mind, but he was confused. You see, God came at him, giving him a vision about dietary laws. Now, it's not a dietary fad or a dietary whatever we've got. It's not like God suggesting, okay, so maybe keto or um, intermittent fasting or low-carb diet. It's not those type of things that we do to get a quick fix to like years of living unhealthily and unhealthy habits. It wasn't that. When God comes and he speaks about dietary laws, it goes so deeply into the religion and the tradition of the Jews. At the very first time that God comes over the nation of Israel and he gives them these laws, the purpose of those laws inter alia is to make them a separate nation amongst the heathen nations that they lived in. In that time, those other nations that lived around them that God wanted to consecrate them from, they would slaughter pigs and drink the pig's blood and offer them to like sacrifices to the gods. And God said, no, you are my people. I'm your God. I want you to live and eat differently. You see, dietary laws wasn't a matter of etiquette or taste or diet. It had to do with social identity. Social identity, as we know through psychology, that is built up through tradition and religion and culture. And God comes and he says, Peter, I want to talk to you about something that you are probably so unwilling to talk about. I want to come and talk about your social identity. If you want to ask why it's so difficult for Peter to step into the reconciliatory role that God has called him for, I would say his tradition, his religion, his culture, his social identity stopped him in his tracks. And God had to go deeper into his life. Now, I shared with you before that um, I'm busy with studies and I'm writing a thesis. And, and in the thesis, we asked two questions. The first question is, why does socioeconomic inequality persist in South Africa, even though we know the devastating impact of it? 
And then the second question that we, that we ask and try to answer is, what would disengage or activate somebody from doing something about it? Now, this study in, a, in, a, in an economic phrase, in a socioeconomic phrase, tries to think about why is reconciliation so difficult for South Africans? Not only for Peter in the Old Testament, but for South Africans. And then also, what detracts us, what disengages us, and then what activates us? Now, what came out of the study is like many, many different things and many pages of writing. But the one thing that I want to share with you today, just thinking about the social identity that keeps us from really recognizing our role and stepping into relationships, is the manifestation of what's called the social unconscious in South Africa. A lot of the interviews that I had, I spoke with, with various people and there are a few manifestations that represented themselves in South Africa. In the theory, they say, if you want to understand whether the social unconscious is impacting people, then look for assumptions, look for disavowals, look for social defenses, look for structural oppression. These are things that we don't see but we experience. It's as if we, we push it away from, into the deepest recesses of our minds because our religion and our culture and our tradition is where we stop thinking. So let me just share two takeouts from, from the study. I'll, I'll use social defenses as an example. So when I spoke with white people, the social defense that they put up against the anxiety of South Africa the anxiety of maybe I had a hand in all of these things that are going on. Maybe I should, I should be doing more, for example. When we spoke about the impact of racism of the past, some of the white people went into denial. And they, and they didn't realize what they were saying. It was, it was something that was something that be, was below the surface. Like, like the one person said, if anybody says that I was privileged or I benefited from apartheid, I would deny it. I was like, well, okay, so um, why would you say that? And he said, I grew up very, very poor. I, you know, I didn't have what my friends had and, and so on and so forth. So I didn't have the privilege. And then I asked him, so where did you go to school? And he mentioned quite a, well, a very good school actually in the, in the public system here in Pretoria. And I didn't say it in the interview, but I just wondered, wow, sure. Um, can you see that you benefited from quality education where other people didn't as a result of the, the apartheid era and you were pushed into success? And this Christian person, didn't, it didn't even register in his mind. The other thing that happened in the study that we, we were able to, to, to identify was that when I spoke with white people, the one thing that they don't deny, but they repress, in other words, they don't even think about it, is the impact of reverse racism. The impact of the possibility that their kids, because of a lot of policies that are in place in South Africa, might not get jobs. None of them spoke about it. In fact, there was only one guy that spoke about it when I, when I asked him the question. So, in 2040, what are you scared about for South Africa? And his answer was, very simply, me being alone. I said, what do you mean? And he, and he just said, look, I don't know if my kids are going to get work here. Maybe they're going to go offshore and maybe my wife and I are going to be here on our own. There's something in the social unconscious that, that says to us that there's a, a denial and a repression of what we're really feeling. The next thing that came out was structural oppression, the impact of structural oppression. And here, speaking with black and Indian people, it was just, it was devastating how things that happened in the past impact us without us actually recognizing it. The one thing that was so clear was that the thought of the 94 elections, people said it gave us freedom. And I said, what did it give you freedom for? And they, they said, um, well, we, we can now, you know, work where we want to, play where we want to, and so on. But what was devastating for me was that freedom actually 
is only a freedom of decision and not of choice. You see, decisions are made based on information and risk and obligation and choices are made based on identity and purpose and calling. You see, the impact on the freedom that people think they have of black tax and Indian tax, having the obligation to give back to the people that got you to study, and then some of those people just not working and, and, and having a free ride on your effort, that impact is with us and we recognize this, but we don't recognize it as a lack of freedom of choice. And how can we then go and study and do what we want to? The other thing that was so devastating for me was when I, when I spoke to some middle-aged people, I, I asked them, okay, so why did you study this thing? And they said, well, you know, when my parents grew up, they, uh, the opportunities that they had was you were successful if you were a nurse or a policeman or a teacher. And then new opportunities came and we were able to do so much more. And then my parents said to me, well, that was success. Now success means you need to be in a professional environment. You need to be a doctor, an engineer, or you need to be a lawyer. But what if I have been called to be a teacher and to change children's lives? That freedom of choice is taken away from me because of what happened in the past. We need to realize that our tradition our culture, our religion, many times stop us short from what God has called us into. And we don't see it. We don't realize it. Peter didn't see it. He didn't realize it. And God chased after his heart because he knew that the reconciliation of that society was in the hands that he wanted to use with Peter. It's as if we have an illness, but we are asymptomatic. We don't realize that we're ill and we start infecting other people. And then we get ill ourselves and we don't know where it comes from. Why do we struggle so to step into reconciliation in relationships? If we read from Peter and if we look at the study that we've conducted, there's a high likelihood that our religion and our tradition and our culture and our social identity keep us away. And I believe the Spirit wants to come lovingly as He did for Peter. And He wants to show you something today. And He wants to show you something in this week that can heal a society because we are called as a people of reconciliation. Okay, so how do we do it? You know, that's easier said than done, right? So I want to go back to Scripture. And I want to look at Peter specifically. We read from the Scripture a few steps. We might not have time for all of them, but a few steps that God, through His Spirit, just ushers Peter through. And I think we can learn practically how we do reconciliation. We know we've been called to it. We know that Many times we are stopped from it. And if we are able to deal with that, that legacy and that, that asymptomatic behavior, this is how you do it. Step one, invite people into your space. Sounds simple? Well, Acts 10 verse 23 says very clearly, Peter invited them in and gave them lodging. That was his first step. Because as a Jewish man, that was the safest step. It was absolutely unacceptable, unauthorized for a Jewish man to step into the house of a Gentile. It was less unacceptable for him to invite a Gentile into his home. Step two, enter somebody else's space. Acts 20, 10, 28 to 29 says the following when he, Peter got to Caesarea. And Peter said to them, You know it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner. But God has shown me that I must not call any person impure or unclean. That 
is why I came without an objection when I was sent for. You see, it is so clear that it was when Peter stepped into Caesarea, into a reconciliation role, into a space that his tradition and his religion and his culture told him that he should not be. It was in the moment of stepping into that space that it was like the scales fell from his eyes and he realized, wow, this is what God meant all along. He meant for me to step into this reconciliation role. I didn't think it was possible. I was arguing. I thought many different things. Wow, this is what God meant. So critical for me is that happens as he steps into, step two, into another person's space. Step three, confront your prejudice. Confront your prejudice. So what is prejudice? Prejudice is a preference that is created through tradition and culture and identity and, and religion. Now that preference that's got a source then gets mixed up with ego and then it becomes prejudice. And in the scripture, we read a third step. When he says, Peter says, God has shown me that I must not call any person impure or unclean. Those two words literally translated mean God called me and showed me that I should not call people by their common distinctions. God steps into Peter's life and he starts breaking down the common distinctions in that era that divided people. We know that having lived through this Acts journey, God had to step into this first generation church and he said, you can't be as exclusionary as you were in the past. We now need to, my purpose all the time was to keep you safe, to keep you clean to keep you honorable because if you understood who I am and what I have done for you you as a nation can then take that and reconcile through the ministry of reconciliation this message this gospel to other people it's been my plan all along but now in act it was such a critical point where God said okay but guys we need to we need to do away with this exclusionary thought that you had through your social identity the first thing that he did, as we know, he sent Stephen. And Stephen started teaching the Jews that God is not only in the temple. Because they said, no, it's only us in the temple, nobody else. And, and Stephen, God sent Stephen. And he said, okay, but God is not only in the temple. You know, God can find Gentiles and other people in different places. He sent Philip to cross the, the cultural divide into Samaria. He sent Philip again to cross the rich and poor divide when he baptized the Ethiopian treasurer. And here... In Acts 10, God uses Peter to take the last step in sanctifying their prejudice. Somebody once wrote, In our journey of sanctification, our journey of becoming more and more and more like Christ, more and more like those Jesus people following after Christ, being His disciple, in our journey of sanctification, our prejudices are often the last to be touched. We don't have time for the other steps, but I want to invite you into a moment with God and with the people around you. I believe and I've prayed with my whole heart that as we were talking about being a people of reconciliation, as we were talking about answering these questions, am I called to reconciliation? Yes, I have been called. Why do we struggle so? We get stuck many times in our religion and our tradition and our culture. And then are there steps that I can take? Yes, there are steps that I can take. And this is what, what God showed us. I've prayed that the Holy Spirit, while I was speaking, would come and shine lovingly a light on a space and a relationship that you might be in, that God is calling you towards reconciliation, even though there's a block 
in your heart. And we want to give the opportunity now for ministry through the Holy Spirit and to each other. And maybe as you're sitting there in your living room or wherever you are, just making time for God to speak into your life, highlighting that relationship, that community, that situation that He has called you to be a people of reconciliation, a person of reconciliation. We're going to follow up what God is doing in your heart today in our community groups on Wednesday where we want to have a moment where we share with each other what is stopping us. And maybe God would reveal through His Spirit the history of where the pain or the suffering or the uncertainty, where the social unconscious came from. That we're going to do on Wednesday. And on Wednesday, hopefully, we can commit to each other just one step in the, res in the rest of the week that we can take towards reconciliation. And in the follow-up, in the next community group, maybe we can just share with each other what we've experienced, what we've learned, being a people of reconciliation. I want to pray for us as we close. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are indwelling us and that you are empowering us to be a people of reconciliation. I pray that you will, through promptings and visions and words and pictures and and whatever we need at this point in time, that you will come and show us. Give us the vision that you have given Peter and that you've given so many different people. Give us our personal vision of what you are calling us to do in our places of work or study. Lord, show us what your heart is in our role for reconciliation. I pray this in the most beautiful name that I know, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.